23 and 24 of Luke Gospel 13 chapter. Luke 13, starting in 22. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Let's pray. But we do praise you this morning for all that's already taking place in this service. Lord, we're thankful for your Holy Spirit and thankful, Lord, for uh, the time of worship that we've already had. And pray now, Lord, as our hearts are ready that your word will go out and accomplish just what you sent it to do this morning or we realize that nothing is by chance, nothing's by luck, nothing just happens, but that Lord you order all things and Lord you brought us here this morning with a purpose and a reason in mind. And I pray Lord that uh, we would move ourselves out of the way and just uh, be faithful and obedient enough to allow you to work in us. Lord when it's said and done we'll say it's been good to be in your house. We ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Uh, got a kick out of this morning uh, during announcements as uh, as lots of our children seem to be uh, agitated <laughs> because as we get to these texts, a lot of you gonna get agitated. You just gonna holler and scream out like they did. Although some of you might. Uh, tough verses. This is this is really really strong and tough and. Some folks may not can take what it says. Uh, I'll remind you that the crux of the text, if, if your Bible's got red letters, is written in red. So this is Jesus speaking. This ain't Tommy speaking. So when you get mad, uh, send all your uh, comment cards to Jesus. Don't send them to me. But picking up where we, we left off last Sunday, Jesus has just been teaching about the kingdom of God. He, he always talked about the kingdom. The kingdom of God. And in, in verse 22 we get the setting. It says he's going through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And that's what he's been doing. I don't know if you can remember back, but way back in Luke 9 uh, in verse 51 of Luke 9 we kind of talked about how that was a transition verse moving us into uh, another area it came to pass when the time was come that he should be uh, received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. 951 was the turning point in the ministry of Jesus where his ministry uh, in his homeland of, of Galilee and that area finished and he begins his journey towards Jerusalem with his face set towards Jerusalem and begins to work and preach and minister throughout the cities and villages on his way to Jerusalem. We're working up to uh, Luke 19 and 28. Luke 19, 28 says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. So from 951 to 1928, we get his ministry in the area of Judea, south of Galilee, going towards to get to the ultimate goal of being in Jerusalem. The text says he's going from the cities and villages and he is teaching. He's teaching. I think sometimes we forget Jesus was a teacher. He was the teacher. And he's teaching about one thing. Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. He's just got through comparing it to two things. A mustard seed, the first, and then leaven, the second. We kind of gave you this uh, conclusion or easy way to see it last week. It started small, but it had a huge growth. He's comparing the kingdom to something 
really small. We talked about the mustard seed. We talked about leaven. So a, a logical question comes up. It, if it's small like it, if the kingdom of God is small like this, then there is there really just a small number of people that are being saved? I mean, that's the, a logical, honest question considering what Jesus has just compared the kingdom to. Uh, and, and after all, we know, the kingdom of God is the sphere of salvation. Entering into the kingdom is being saved. And so the question comes, are there just a few being saved? Entering into the kingdom has always been about salvation. That's nothing new to, to Jesus and his teaching. That being delivered from the kingdom of Satan in this world and being delivered into the kingdom of God. Being saved. Being saved from what? Being saved from God. From God's wrath. Being saved by God and his grace. He saves us with his grace from his wrath. So the question gets raised there in verse 23. Lord, are there few that be saved? And again, in red letters, verse 24, here's Jesus' answer. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Wow. What is this? Strive. That, that makes it sound like it's difficult. Strive. You know, hey, we always preach that being saved is easy. Yes, we've always preached that being saved is easy. I mean, I mean, Jesus did the work, right? He finished the work on the cross. Our part is faith, right? And surely we know faith is easier than dying on the cross. So it's got to be easy. But but we get this strive. What is striving? What's this uh, that some will want to come in and won't be able to? I mean, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 10? In Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, and then uh, down in verse 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then just a couple of verses over in 13, the verse we know so well, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look, that sounds easy, doesn't it? That's, that is salvation. That is Romans' road to salvation. That's, that's easy to do. So, so why do we have this passage of Jesus giving the answer that he gives in the text in verse 24? And it will continue on through the next several verses, and we would never be able to get all those verses done. And again, you'd say amen to that. So we're going to look really just at his answer in 24, kind of what that says to us and what it means. Are there just a few being saved? I heard this statistic, and it's an old statistic, uh, I would say it's, it's not quite like that now, but it just kind of gives you the, the difference. That is, they surveyed a, a group of people, a group of Americans in our country. 81% of the group that they questioned said that they were Christians. 81%. 8 out of every 10, they asked, are you a Christian? The answer was yes. And then when they asked them, did they have a biblical view of the world? Did, did they look at things through a biblical view with biblical values? 9% said yes. Less than one out of every 10. That doesn't work. You can't have eight out of every 10 say they're a Christian 
And only one of those eight says they have a biblical view of the world and what's going on. Something doesn't match. Something there doesn't compute. And so there's a big group of folks you have to wonder about. Preacher, you can't be judging. I ain't judging. I'm just going by what Jesus said. And I'm going by that the Bible is clear that by their fruits you shall know them. So, are there really 8 out of 10 that's really saved? Or is it as low as 1 out of every 10 that really has a biblical world view? I don't know. I think it, in this area, what time is it? 11.40? I, I didn't bring a watch, sorry. Is it 11 40 most everybody's in church is going to church at 11 40. I know some people, you got big churches, got an early one, and folks go to the early one and they're done by the day. But a lot of folks at church right now, some of them's getting ready to go because their preacher gets them out in time for lunch. Sorry, amen. But uh, <laughs> a lot of folks there. So if you if you just stopped right now and ran over to Walmart, you wouldn't think you'd find a whole lot of Christians at Walmart right now. But I, I, I bet you say Walmart's packed right now. And I venture to say that if you call them as they're coming out of the parking lot and you ask them are they Christians, their answer would be yes. Yes, because that's a good thing to say. Are you going to heaven? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But are they? And are they? Better yet, are you? And are you? Preacher, I'm here. Amen. Thank God for it. I'm glad you are. This is a tough, tough saying. I worry a lot about how many church members, not just that Shannon has, we have, but how many church members across this area, across this state, across this nation, across this world, how many church members are there who've never been saved? Well, preacher, how, how are they a church member if they don't get saved? Well, they, they got baptized, they joined the church somewhere, they moved the letter here, moved the letter there, ended up here, ended up there. But just because you got a letter, don't mean you saved. Just because you've been baptized, don't mean you saved. It worries me because there'll be some folks who have literally convinced themselves that they're saved because of something that they did that has nothing to do with being saved. And when the trumpet sounds and the shout goes out and all God's children go to meet the Lord in the air to ever be with the Lord and they look around, they're going to wonder, what just happened? Why are they gone? Why am I still here? Or they'll take their last breath before that trumpet sounds. They'll open up their eyes and be in hell. They get a lot of smiles as much as y'all can get agitated like them babies. Y'all can say hollered out you. This is tough stuff. But it's true. I do worry about that. I worry about how many folks maybe got saved while I was preaching. Or didn't get saved while I was preaching, but thought they did. Preacher, what, what, what do you mean? Well, again, you get Jesus' answer about this striving. And I wonder how many just emotional hearers maybe got coerced into thinking they were saved. And, and that's a controversial topic. I, I've explained this to you before, but I, I'll say it again this morning. There's a reason why... I'm a two-verse invitation person. I don't prolong invitations. I, I don't appreciate prolonged invitations as such. When I have a guest preacher or brass preacher, I may throw in a story at the end that, that, that his message made me think of, but, and I know he doesn't mind, <coughs> guest preachers, hey, we just, we're having the invitation. We open the altar up. We open the church doors up. That's it. Preacher, you know, if you just 
preach a little longer than the invitation. If you just have a little longer invitation, you might could coax some folks into coming in. That, that's where the line to me is at. Am I coaxing them or is God pulling them and moving them? I feel like if God's pulling them and moving them, it don't take but one verse. <laughs> and and they'll, they'll be there. Well, preacher, I, I, I sat there and it was the fourth verse before I came. And they, it ain't man I understand that. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying that I think there's a lot of folks that maybe just didn't really get saved. You, do you realize that invitations and altar calls at the end of a service are a recent thing in the church? They'll, they trace it back, they like to trace it back to a fellow named Charles Finney, early to mid-1800s, about 1825, 18, to 1850. Sorry, Charles, he was a lawyer turned into a preacher. We ain't saying nothing about lawyers. I'm just saying that's what he was. He's a lawyer who became an evangelist. And he took the skills that he had in convincing a jury to believe how he wanted them to believe and used that in his preaching and in his call or invitation at the end of a service to come up and sit at the anxious seat is what he called it that we in turn began to call the altar so you think about it, for the first 1800 years of the church there never was a such thing as a altar call or an invitation when we talk about folks that, that preached uh, during great revival time jonathan edwards you know we've talked about before he would, he would preach sinners in the hand of an angry god he spoke in a monotone voice and, voice, and he just read off a sheet and read his message in one tone. And when he was finished, would fold his paper and walk out. And folks would just be falling all over the place, praying to God in repentance and asking for forgiveness. And there, there was no altar call for something. Preacher, I got saved in an altar call. Guess what? I did too. I got saved at an altar call. And I came down to an altar that's how I got saved. And I'm not saying that's wrong at all. What I'm saying is, I do worry that there's been a lot of folks that came down to an altar and never repented, never got saved. And got up out of that altar and through some convincing of their own selves, maybe even of the devil, they think they are, but they're not. And thus, they're not in God's church. They're not in God's house. They don't know God's word. There's no relationship there because they never really did enter into the kingdom of God. And when it's time at the end, they'll wonder why. And they'll be, as Jesus said there in verse 24, they'll seek to enter in, but they won't be able. That does, amen, not just worry me, but amen, I'll just say it, it scares me. Now again, all of us sitting in here may have been saved at an altar call, may have been saved in an altar, may have been saved during an invitation, maybe even been saved during an invitation that went seven, eight, nine verses, and there's nothing wrong with that. It has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. Again, I just worry about a group that may not be and I think back to that question that's asked of Jesus, are there just a few really saved? That's a sobering question this morning. Jesus actually starts with this idea of striving. You have to, to strive. The Greek word for strive that's used in the text here is the same word that we get the word agonize from. Well, that doesn't sound easy, does it? Agonize. An intense struggle. Traditionally, the word that's used here that gets translated uh, in our text was a word used for, for athletics and competitions. Specifically, in athletics and competition, uh, a fight. So it's a word used for fight. Fight to enter in. Strive to enter in. Agonize to enter in. 
compete with all you have to enter in. Well, it doesn't sound easy, does it? Jesus makes it sound like it's not easy. The same word is not used anywhere else in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John does use it once, but Paul used it a little bit because we know Paul likes to write about <coughs> athletics and comparing things to striving in athletics. I guess the, the best passage would, would be 1 Corinthians 9, where he's writing to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. And every man that strives, there's that same word that gets to fights, competes, agonizes, for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, same root there, strive, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. And then in uh, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Again, the idea of striving or fighting. Lord, are, are there just a few getting saved? And Jesus' answer is, you better strive. You better fight. You better agonize. I mean, what is this? And, and what's he talking about striving and fighting for? He says strive to enter in. question is, how do we enter into the kingdom of God? Strive to enter in at the straight gate. We've heard those words all our life. Straight gate. Our language, our vernacular for that would be a narrow door. Strive to enter in at the narrow door. So Jesus is telling them in their answer to this, there's a narrow door, and you got to fight to get through it. you got to strive. you got to agonize to get through the narrow door. Some of y'all don't know what it's like to have to try to get through a narrow door. If you're fat like me, you know what a narrow space is. It's hard sometimes. you got to work at it. You do all you can, you still can't get through there. You skinny folks, y'all got advantage over us. But when the wind blows, we don't go nowhere. <laughs> Strive. Fight. Doing everything I can, and the door's narrow. I mean, it's narrow. I got to do everything I can to try to fight to get through a narrow door. Lord, are there just a few being saved? Fight you might get through the narrow door. It doesn't sound like what we've heard most of our life, but it does sound familiar because we you know it sounds a little bit like what Jesus taught in Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 verses uh, 13 and 14. Again, red letters. Enter ye in at the straight gate, the narrow door. For wide is the gate, or wide is the door, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And here it is. And many there be which go in thereat. A lot of folks going through the wide door. And then verse 14, because straight is the gate, or narrow is the door, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And Jesus again says, and few there be that find it. So which one is it? Is 80% of Americans Christians? Or is it more like that 9% that say they got a biblical view of the world? I garnered to say this morning, there's going to be a lot of disappointed folks when the trumpet sounds. There's been a lot of disappointed folks when they took their last breath, opened their eyes, and they weren't where they just knew they would be. So that's tragic, preacher. It is. It's awful. It's terrible. I see it all the time. What do you mean you see it all the time, preacher? I see it all the time when, when I get asked to do a funeral for somebody. And the reason I get asked is not because they were a church member of mine, 
But I get asked because they want a church member nowhere and they ain't never had a preacher and the family ain't got a preacher because they live like a devil all day long. But I get asked to do the, the service and they all they want to talk about is over there in heaven looking down on us. And, I, and I'm like, where do you get that from? Where, where do you get that from? Where do you see that? Where does Scripture say that you never have a relationship with Jesus, you never repent, you never have a transformed life, but I guess God is love, so when you die, you're going to heaven. That is not what the Word says. If that's what the Word said, Jesus would have said when they asked Him, are there just a few being saved? He said, no, everybody's getting saved. I'm dying for everybody. Everybody's going to be saved. We're all going to heaven. There is no hell. But He didn't say that. It's not what He said. He said, strive to enter in the narrow door. Fight to enter in the narrow door. A lot of folks going through the wide doors. Few are going through the straight gate. Man, that's tough stuff. That's tough stuff. You should sit here today, take stock of your heart and your life, and praise the Lord you've repented and been saved and you're a child of God and you know you're going through the narrow door, you ought to praise Him this morning. Amen. Amen. You ought to praise Him. And if that's not you, you ought to get off that wide way and get on that narrow way before it's too late. Because I'm telling you, I told y'all last week, that boy asked me in my class, Coach, you really think the Lord's coming back soon? Yes, I do. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I want to be wrong thinking that he's coming and looking for him than to be wrong and be called a scoffer in the last day that says, where's the promise of his coming? Get off the wide way. Get on the narrow way. Preacher, there's nobody sitting in here that that refers to. I hope not. But as it goes out over the ways, as people watch it on YouTube, Facebook, I hope that if there's somebody that's not in that few. They'll repent. Give their heart to Jesus. And enter into the kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about here. He says all the time that if you lose your life, you gain him. Because if you gain life, you gain all the things the world tells you, you gain and you lose him, you lose your soul, what good is it? It's for no. At the end of the day, it's, it's seeing God for who He really is and repenting and giving all up to Him to enter into that kingdom, to strive to enter into that narrow door. I, I spoke at a Bible study this past week, the, the Moore Cole Bible study. And if you've never been to that and I, I, it's, a, it's a good thing. I, you got time on, on a Thursday night um, at 7 o'clock at uh, uh, the lady that runs uh, More Cold, Judy, at, at her big house. She's got the downstairs done. And you go in, and, 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 a, and a preacher gives a, a message, and then you eat a, a good home cooked <coughs> dinner and uh, fellowship with each other and there. And it, it, it's, it's neat. I've been asked several times to come speak out spoke out again this past Thursday night. But when I did, I, I sat beside a man that's all, usually always there. Really good fella. I, I love to talk to him. He's really sound doctrinally. He's really a deep thinker when it comes to things. And he, he's always very attentive. And he always has a question for me or, or something at the end. And, and just so happened that uh, uh, me and Valerie Man went. We sat down. We happened to sit down. I sat down right beside him in the chair. And he began to talk to me. He pulls out a sheet. And he says, I've been wanting to give this to somebody, and I think you're the one I need to give it to. So I, he gave it to me, and I read it, and I thought, wow, this is really good. Then as I looked at the text and thought about the verses and thought about that few and so many and narrow and, and wide and, and, and the view of the kingdom of God as people see it, but then against what God says it is and how Jesus says you get into it, and it's 
really a microcosm of everything we go through. This book, it's just a, a mimeograph sheet. Do you even use that word anymore? It's a Xerox, copy, whatever. Uh, sheet out of a book. And I don't know the book. I, I want to find the book. It's, it's an old book. I can tell by the writing in the book. But it's funny how even way back then, kind of the same ideas that, that, that we have today. And I, I was going to read you a little bit of it. It says, the, the secret is an open one which the wayfaring man may read. It is simply the old and ever new counsel, acquaint thyself with God. Acquaint thyself with God. <laughs> to regain her lost power, the church must see heaven opened and have a transforming vision of God. Why? Because along the way the church has sometimes lost its vision of who God is. What do you mean, preacher? Well, he, he explains it here. But the God we must see is not the utilitarian God who is having such a run of popularity today, whose chief claim to men's attention is his ability to bring them success in their various undertakings and who for that reason is being cajoled and flattered by everyone who wants a favor. That's pretty wordy and old-fashioned language, but I think you understand what he's saying. The God we must learn to know is the majesty in the heavens. God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The only wise God, our Savior. He it is that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, who stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Our vision, how we see God, directly affects how we see the kingdom, affects how we see sin, affects how we see what God does in our life and why he does it. How we see who God really is and what he does and who is man that he's even mindful of us. How do we see it? Are there few that enter in? Or is it a broad, broad way? Jesus said, strive to enter in. You were here Wednesday night. I'll close with this. The only time I'm going to say it because I'm closing with it. I stay tired all the time now. I mean, all the time. Well, preacher, you're getting old. Bingo. I am. That's exactly what it is. I'm getting old. And I complain about doing all the stuff you got to do because I'm a complainer. Because I just want to be lazy, but I don't get to be lazy. But I'm tired because I spend a lot of time striving for stuff. All week long, I'm striving, I'm striving, I'm striving. All week long, I'm running late, I'm running late, I'm running late. Because I got more stuff to do than I got time to do. I'm striving, I'm striving. And then I read this verse this morning. And I ask to myself, in just the last week, in all the striving that I did, how much of that striving had anything to do with the kingdom of God? And so I ask you that question because I've already asked myself. Because you're just like me. You're tired too. Because you're striving too. Because the world's a busy place. And we got more stuff to do and we got time to do it. And we spend all our waking hours striving. But I want to ask you, how much of your striving has anything to do with the kingdom of God? Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Are there just a few getting saved? 
She said, there's a many that want to get in and can't. There's just a few that are getting saved. I pray this morning that all of us are. But if you're not, I'd ask you, amen, <clears throat> stop. Repent. Ask Jesus into your heart. Jump off the broad way and get in the narrow way. Amen. amen. While we stand, Brad comes and he's coming to the Lord. Verse of invitation. We already know why I preach. We're going to have two verses. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you. I believe you'll come while we sing. Thank you.